Hello everybody, my name is Jacek Bartosiak. Welcome to Strategy in Future. Today, to, to, uh, today uh, I, along with Albert Trudzinski, will be hosting uh, our favorite uh, thinker <laughs> on uh, world finance, uh, geopolitics, related to macroeconomics, uh, Louis Vincent Gaff. How, how are you? That, that's very kind of you to say. That's uh, very, very nice, flattering words, but it's, uh, it's great to catch up uh, with both you and Albert. I, uh, I always enjoy it. Yeah, you know, I, I, we have talked already sev sev several times, but I still, your book about the clash of empire, empires still resonates in my head, uh, particularly given the, uh, the events that we are seeing uh, nowadays daily. And we will talk about it, but let me start with the following general question. I'm confused, Luis. Actually, <laughs> I'm confused. I listen to many economists these days. I listen to a lot of experts on YouTube. I listen to, you know, I read a lot. And That's I, probably why you're confused. You listen to too many people. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, because I'm, be, I'm, I'm, I'm being shelled by all, all this information about bankruptcy, mm -hmm. bank crises, all those things that you are very well aware of. And still I have no clear picture where are we heading. And it is, this is why we kindly uh, try to invite you uh, to our podcast, because uh, I believe that you will clear out those, uh, you know, fog of un of lack of knowledge of or understanding. So, what is what is your gut feeling? What do you think? What's going on, basically? I'll, th I'll start with some very bad news, if it's okay. I'm not going to clear the fog for you, and you're not going to come out of this any less confused than you walked in, uh, for a very simple reason. Uh, I'm as confused as you are. Um, and I've said in, in previous and in recent interviews, and I've been saying to clients on, on conference calls that, you know, I've, I've been doing this for roughly 25 years now. And to be honest, this is about as challenging a period as I can recall, more challenging than post 2008, more challenging than the European crisis, because right now it feels that you have things coming at you from so many different directions, um, pulling you in, uh, in all sorts of different directions as well. So if you look at just cyclically, you, you have a slowdown in Europe, you have a slowdown in the U.S., and you have China that's re-accelerating. Um, you know, you look at the credit numbers in China, It's really they just released some new credit numbers today. It's really starting to pick up. Um, and, you know, in my career, I've never had a slowdown in the number one economy in the world and the number two economy in the world re-accelerating at the same time. Um, then you go into the sort of more structural trends. You know, for 25 years, we had free trade, globalization, global integration of economies, and it's pretty clear we're, we're moving away from that. Uh, we're moving into a world that's sort of breaking up into different blocks. Um, and I guess maybe if you're, you know, 100 years old, you remember this from post-World War II, but, um, you know, when we decided, when the Cold War started, and you had on one side Eastern Europe, on the other side Western Europe, um, the economic integration wasn't what it was today. You know, the, the amount of trade that, let's say, France did with the Soviet Union or with Poland or Bulgaria was peanuts. Um, very different from today's situation where China is more or less everybody's biggest trade partner, if it's not the biggest, second biggest for most countries. And then we're deciding, ah, maybe we should do less with China. So I think that's a huge uncertainty. And, you know, you plugged my book. Thank you very much. Um, that was that was a theme of my book in 2019. I think it, this has massive, massive repercussions. And then you have other factors. You know, you have the fact that labor forces around the world are no longer growing, wherever you care to look. You know, we've been used to having, you know, constant flow of workers out of China, constant flow of workers out of Poland, you know, the, the legendary Polish workers that came to uh, to build the, the houses in London, et cetera, they're not coming anymore. Um, so, you know, you, this flow of excess workers in the world is, uh, has disappeared. Um, and all this against a background of, background of you know, rec record amount of debt in, um, in, um, uh, across Western uh, governments, um, aging populations, which means you need to pile on more de debt to, pile to pay for pensioners. So, no, li like you, I I'm confused. I think the, the only thing you can do in these difficult times is, on the one hand, listen to the markets to try to figure out what, what is happening. Um, so that's on the one hand. And on the other hand, I think you need to be 
to be pretty modest, you know, if you manage money like like I do, you need to be modest in your position sizing. You need to say, okay, I I don't, you know, if I don't have 100% certainty, you keep your position smaller, you keep more more dry powder, you spread your bets a little a little wider, um, and then as the picture gets clearer, then you press the bets. But yeah, this is a very very tough environment to press bets on. Yeah, having discussed you know the general picture, I would like to move. You know, separately to the United States, Europe, and China. Albert will deal with uh, China and probably with Europe, uh, with my uh, a bit of my help. But I would like to focus now on the United States, and of course, also from the angle of geopolitics a, a bit, uh, which I know you you really like talking about as well. Uh, you know, if, 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 if there are some voices, and also my feeling that, of course, you the United States is structurally the empire, the the empire. And the dollar is uh, the foundation of it. And that creates uh, critical imbalances that are detrimental to the United States economy. We all know that. At the same time, there is the United States as the country, the country, not the empire, where if it decides to move away from being an empire, would re relatively quickly might heal this uh, economic situation. The question is whether the United States establishment understands that this is the right path, or maybe you have a different opinion that this is not the right path. Maybe they are not thinking about it. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm talking about right. the imbalance between because this is structurally keeping a dollar alive is creating tensions across the world. Plus, of course, this is creating uh, deficits, uh, lack of productivity in the U.S. and so on and so forth. How would you comment on that? Of course, my, my question is very general, but you know, because yeah. I don't want to 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 take too much of your time uh, as, no. our, you know, as our guest here. But I, I'm sure you know what I what I refer to. You know? Of course, look, uh, you're referring to the question of de-dollarization, the the move away, um, even amongst U.S. friends or allies like Brazil uh, or in the Middle East. Uh, away from the dollar and towards pricing more and more trade in their own local currencies. Um, you know, India pricing more of its trade in rupees and obviously China and renminbi and Brazil and riyals and, and so on. Um, now, you know, I think what's what's fascinating to me in the U.S. is, you know, the U.S. is obviously uh, a country based on thought, on free speech, on um, on the ability to challenge ideas and uh, and to have heated discussions, you know, I think there's, you know, I think the U.S. can pride itself on having the best universities in the world, um, where a lot of you know top-notch thought goes on. Um, it has a deep uh, free media, uh, whether it be TV, whether it be written press, etc. But um, and on pretty much any topic, if you pick an economic topic or a cultural topic or a social topic, there'll be heated debates. And I, what baffles me a little bit as, as a foreigner looking outside into the U.S. is how when it comes to foreign policy, there really isn't that much debate. You can watch MSNBC or you can watch Fox News and you will get the same message on China. Uh, and what the relationship with China should be. And you'll get the same message on the Middle East, and you'll get the same message on India. When it comes to foreign policy, um, unless you go into sort of very niche uh, reviews, you know, sort of way off the mainstream, it's it's like it's the one part of American society where there seems to be no debate. Um, now, to your point, I think for years that didn't really matter. Um, or actually, before, perhaps there used to be more debate. Let's say, let's take the Iraq war as an example. There were big parts of the U.S. establishments that were against the Iraq war, um, that did warn of the dangers that it would cause to American credibility, that it would cause to American treasury, that it would cause to uh, the life and limbs of young American men and women who fought over there. There, there were people speaking out. Today, who is speaking out in the U.S. against these drums of war against China? You know, it's nobody. Um, it seems that, you know, there, there is a full buy-in of the establishment. Again, whether you go from the far left to the far right, that China's this big enemy and that we have to, you know, increase military spending to to get ready for war with China, etc. Because, you know, they fly weather balloons over our country. Um, and so I think this, I look at it and I'm, I'm, I'm a little 
baffled by this lack of debate uh, around foreign policy. And I think this lack of debate around foreign policy is causing deep discomfort amongst American allies um, who, you know, see, see the one-sided nature of things, um, see how the U.S., you know, when it decides to go to war with Iraq, it goes to war with Iraq. When it decides to, you know, invade Afghanistan, it invades Afghanistan, etc. And this lack of debate, you know, when historically there's been unanimity in the Senate about some, in the Senate about something, it usually wasn't a great idea, um, i.e., invading Afghanistan, invading Iraq. Um, and um, and so today, I think, you know, if you're Brazilian, if you're Mexican, if you're, you know, you look at how the U.S. is so one-sided on the foreign policy front, um, and all of a sudden, you, you, you worry about that direction. And as you worry about that direction, then you worry about the U.S. dollar. You start thinking, hold on, should I be keeping as much, should I be remain as dependent on the U.S. dollar as I am? Uh, or should I hedge my bet? Should I, you know, have the ability to do trade in other currencies so that I'm not 100% dependent on the ability and willingness of American banks to fund to fund my trade? Um, and here you get to the second big problem is I think in the past 15, 20 years, the U.S. has shown time and again a, a predisposition to uh, uh, weaponize the U.S. dollar. To in essence, when when somebody did anything that they didn't like, whether that somebody be Venezuela or Iran or Russia or North Korea, etc., it's like okay, well, yeah, 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 Banque Paribas, you're cut off from the U.S. dollar. And if you want to come back in, if you're BNP, uh, you know, if you want to come back in, then you pay six billion dollar fine, uh, even if the fine is completely disproportionate to to the the offense committed. Um, and so, you know, as as countries see this, you know, as you see the, the dollar weaponized against more and more people, it means the dollar gets more and more dangerous. You know, you, you start thinking, you know, I'm putting myself in a position where from one day to the next, the U.S. can, and you know, force me to do something I don't want to do through, through the method of the U.S. dollar. So if you're Mexico, for example, now, of course, Mexico can't de-dollarize because it's really so, so integrated in the U.S. economy. But, um, but you know, let's say you're Brazil. Um, you're Brazil, and today you look at how the U.S. weaponizes the U.S. dollar against Venezuela. Now, you, you might worry that tomorrow the U.S. may tell Brazil, well, look, uh, we really are angry about Venezuela, so you can't trade with Venezuela anymore. Otherwise, we're going to block you off the U.S. dollar as well. You know, and before you know it, so you're Brazil, then you have no choice. You have to cut off links with Venezuela, even though it might not be at your national interest. I guess the point I'm making is that by weaponizing the U.S. dollar so frequently, um, the U.S. is highlighting to countries everywhere that being so dependent on the U.S. dollar is is a danger for them and could go against their own national interest. Um, and so I think that's you know that's that that's the trend that we're seeing. I think that's why the U.S. dollar has been weakening for the past year since since the start of the Russian sanctions. Um, I think that's why the U.S. Treasury market uh, is you know fairly unexciting even in the face of a of a slowdown in the U.S. Um, I think de-dollarization is real now. It's it's happening slowly and gradually, but more and more countries are going to turn away from the from the U.S. because the U.S. is being too much of a bully. Mm. Don't you think that there are many paradoxes here, even uh, uh, given your book, uh, inside uh, uh, from your book, that uh, the dollarization will be the last symptom of the fall, decline of the U.S. empire? Uh, plus, yes. uh, that, you know, the, uh, uh, as I and Albert uh, are thinking on strategy in the future, is that uh, th th there is a major difference between the United States today and the United States in the 50s and 60s of the last century, where the uh, United States was given incentives to the Allies, opening yes. up markets, uh, yes. not penalizing them, not punishing them, but opening up to them so that they are also yielding uh, premiums, yielding fruits from this cooperation as being an ally. Oh, you, 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 th these absolutely. days they don't do it. They, the Americans, they don't do it, but at the same time, they want to remain the, the empire. And yep. uh, what do you think? How to you know how to make ends meet in, in, in that respect? Well, you don't. So that this time is China is the main you know factor. It's not mm -hmm. a poor Soviet Union. How how no, no, would you no. comment on that? 
Well, no, I would say China has picked up the, the United States playbook of the 1940s and 50s. You know, I think the One Belt, One Road uh, initiative is not, you know, it's a copy paste of the Marshall Plan. The Asia Inf Infrastructure Investment Bank is a copy paste of the World Bank. The Silk Road Fund could be, you know, seen as a new IMF and so on. They just, I don't think China invented anything. They just, you know, took what the U.S. did it's very successfully in the 40s and 50s and, and is copying that. Um, in its own backyard and, you know, further and further, be, you know, even all the way to Eastern Europe and, of course, uh, well into Africa. Um, so, yeah, you know, I think it's, um, you know, in French, we say, on n'attrape pas les mouches avec du vinaigre. You, you don't catch flies with vinegar. Um, you know, you, you need your track flies with honey. Uh, you, you need something sweet, sweet to bring them in. And um, I think it reflects a certain hubris from the united states where they think that um you know the u.s got to be so strong and so powerful and the u.s dollars are important and u.s capital markets so important that access to this became so you know yeah so so very important for everybody that the u.s thinks well we don't need to be nice with people they can they just have to do what they're told um is it still the case yeah, this, this is the but problem. i think i think it's still the case a little bit but with every year that goes by, it's less and less because people don't like it. So they're going to look. They're going to look for alternatives. Sure, um, but do the Americans realize? Because this is, I think, the problem. This is a thing they don't seem to get. It's again, and going back to Europe, it's like you know, uh, this, I think. I think there's hubris Europeans right now with IRAs. Right? Yeah, yeah. No, no. I think it's. I think it's pure hubris. Um, I don't think the policymakers really realize it, uh, or do they? Or maybe they don't care. Um, but I think most, you know, when you when you, I talk, to, we have a lot of American clients. And when you talk about these things, you get accused of being an anti-American, which which I'm not. You know, my wife is American. I went to college in the U.S. I, you know, I, I used to be as Atlantis. I was the most Atlantis Frenchman you could have ever met. Um, but but you have to look at the world that you live in and the, the consequences of the actions you, you've taken. And um, and and so no, I don't think there I don't think there is that realization at all. Um, and it's, I mean, there, there is some, there's people talking about this, you know, Robert Kennedy Jr. talks about this all day, every day. Jeffrey Sachs talks about this all day, every day. Um, there, there are some people in the United States who, who do realize this. I think Rand Paul, Senator Rand Paul uh, realizes this. Um, so you have some people who talk about it, but they're definitely in a small minority um, and and not having an impact on, on policy. Um, the, the, you know, the policy is, is what it is. Um, it's a policy of weaponizing the U.S. dollar against uh, today's enemies and tomorrow's perceived enemies. Uh, it's a policy of weaponizing America's comparative advantages, most, most notably its semiconductor industry against other countries. So you say, okay, you, you know, you, you can't access this and you can't access that. Um, and in so doing, you almost force other countries to create a parallel financial system, create a parallel semiconductor industry. And this doesn't come overnight. It takes time. But once it's built, then it's done. You know, once China will have re rebuilt the semiconductor industry, then you won't be able to use the semiconductor to browbeat China with. It'll be done. Um, and I would say, same, you know, once, once you've built, uh, you know, the pipes to trade more in renminbi, to trade more in Indian rupee, to trade more in Brazilian reais, then the the need for dollars around the world will will all of a sudden found to be very, much lower than anybody expects. And then, if if I could ask, because the weaponization of dollar is one thing, but the other damage I think that the U.S. dealt to the global economy was with the the way it managed interest rates and the way it impacted. You know the, the problems with liquidity in Europe, but also I think Asians are really afraid of you know knowing the history of 1997, right, the, or 1998 crisis. And I no. was wondering if you could you could present our viewers uh, a basic rundown of what was, uh, for example, how the SVB, which I suppose was to to a large extent, apart from the the bank leadership being incompetent and going along with with the T-bills, right, but also how this impacted. Both the credit suites and how you know that there was the credit lines uh, like uh, opened up right by the by the Fed uh, yep. with the major European banks and how it's impacting Asians 
Asian markets. And, 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 and uh, how does it impact the perceptions across the allies, uh, you know, the world? What is the balance of power? You know, I mean, what's this, uh, the, whether the U.S. is weak or strong, you know, what signal it, it sends to investors across the world? Look, I think uh, a thousand page books will be written about all these issues. Um, so it'll, it'll, it'll be a little hard to, dis, you know, to go through them in just uh, just sure. a few words, but but I'll try my best. I'll try my best. Um, and yeah, you know, you mentioned ninety seven, which you know to me is a key era, a key marking point uh, in the in the environment because you know in the ninety seven ninety eight crisis that started in Asia, then moved to Russia, and ended up going to Turkey and Latin America, Brazil and Argentina. Um, emerging market middle class were basically wiped out. You know, if you're a middle class guy in Thailand or in um, Indonesia, you were you were wiped out, absolutely taken out. You know, you had your currency in Indonesia, the currency fell 92%. You know, and, you know, a lot of these guys had debt in US dollars, assets in local currencies. It was an absolute disaster. Now, you know, I'm almost 50 years old. Uh, I started my career at the time of the Asian crisis. It means that, you know, most policymakers in emerging markets today, anybody who's over 50, who's over my age, will have gone through that period and thought to himself, never again. You know, never again must I, must our country go through something like this. So whether you were Chinese or Thai or Indonesian or, you know, South African or Brazilian, embedded in your DNA was the trauma of that crisis. And the feeling that I can't have this happen again. And how do you make sure it doesn't happen again? Well, I must make sure that I'm never dependent on Western banks for funding. And so that means that I need to always run current account surpluses. And I'm always going to recycle these current account surpluses that I'm earning into Western currencies. Most most notably U.S. Treasuries, but maybe some German bonds, maybe some JGBs, but mostly U.S. Treasuries. And so we've lived in this odd world where in essence, poor people in poor country kept sending their kept saving too much and sending their excess savings to rich people in rich countries who could afford to live well beyond their means. Um, and they did this for one reason and one reason only, was the perceived uh, safety that the assets in the US or the UK or France um, delivered. It's like, okay, whatever happens, I know that my U.S. treasuries are safe, you know. And I think this is where everything's gone wrong in the past 18 months is basically, you know, through the combination of crazy monetary and fiscal policies during COVID, you know, basically spending way too much money during COVID and printing way too much money. Um, and at the same time, crazy geopolitical um, uh, policies where right at the time where we're the most dependent on emerging market savings coming back to our countries, we, you know, the Western world basically tells them it's our way or the highway. Um, and on that front, I think a key mistake Western policymakers made was not so much to nationalize, and I think we've talked about this before, not so much to nationalize the assets of the Russian central banks, but most importantly, to take over the assets of all the rich Russian oligarchs sitting in London and Paris and, you know, their yachts, their football clubs, their houses, et cetera. Now, granted, you know, uh, I don't want to be seen like I'm holding a candle for the Russian, the Russian oligarchs. Um, but what truly mattered here is that we took away all these assets without a court of law, debate in parliament. We basically had Boris Johnson, Emmanuel Macron, Justin Trudeau, and Biden get together for a weekend and say, you know what, let's just take these guys' assets. And all of a sudden, if you're a rich Chinese, if you're a rich Indonesian, if you're a rich Saudi, you think, well, hold on. If it's the Russian tomorrow, it could be, if it's the Russian today, it could be me tomorrow. You know, if tomorrow MBS decides to kill more journalists in his consulates, does that mean that I lose my house in London? Um, now, you know, the, the the very reason people from emerging markets kept buying houses in London or Vancouver or Miami or wherever else was the perception of property rights and being sacrosanct in the in the Western world. That you know, once you own something in the Western world, people can't take it away from you without a trial and without you being guilty of a crime. 
And here, all of a sudden, it's like you're guilty by association, right? Which is supposed to not happen in the Western world. You're supposed to only be responsible for your own crimes. You're not responsible for your father's crimes. You're not responsible for your son's or daughter's crime. Uh, you're responsible for what you do. Now, all of a sudden, you're responsible for what Putin does if you're Russian. Uh, and and so this completely upended, I think, the, in the emerging. Then, if you're Chinese, you look at this, and you're like, oh, then they're just like us. They're just like me in China. They claim to have this legal system. They claim to have these property rights. But when it's convenient for the prime minister to take your stuff, he will. So this is just like China, no, no different. And so all of a sudden, combine this, I think, massive on goal with this really crazy, stupid fiscal and monetary policies. And if you're sitting in emerging markets, you think, I don't want to recycle my money into Western markets anymore. And so you get to the very odd situation we saw last year, where in a, in a year where U.S. treasuries went down 20%, where German boons went down 25%, when JGBs went down 20%, um, all in U.S. dollar terms. Brazilian bonds went up 10%. Mexican bonds went up 10%. Chilean bonds went up 8%. Indonesian bonds went up 3 or 4 South African bonds were roughly flat. You know, In my career, emerging markets have always been the redhead stepchild of markets. When things went bad, it went really bad in emerging markets. Like They were the first ones to get beaten up. Not last year. Last year, big bear markets on all assets. And if you made money in markets last year, it was emerging markets. And I think the reason is very simple. The, all the excess savings in the world today happen in emerging markets. They're the ones running big current account surpluses. They're running fiscal fiscal policies that more or less make sense. No big, big budget deficits, etc. Most most of them. Um, there's big excess domestic savings, and instead of going to the Western world, now the savings stay at home. So all of a sudden, and now you know people are starting to catch up to on this and they're like oh this is de-dollarization this is uh, you know you get Farid Zakaria on CNN saying oh this is de-dollarization etc but it's it's the confluence of many things but the bottom line is emerging markets savings now stay in emerging markets this is very bullish emerging markets and it's bad news for us i mean us being western world and also people. self-inflicted not really oh, completely self-inflicted yeah Complete self-inflicted. And out of hubris, no, no. that's what you, you sort of... I think it's I think it was hubris on the monetary policy front, hubris on the fiscal policy front, hubris on international relations front. We, you know, we, we broke everything. We broke every rule. Um, and we broke every rule out of political convenience. Um, it was convenient to lock people down because you didn't want to be seen to be killing grandma. And then it's like, oh, we, let's do that. And then it's like, well, people are going to, you know... People have lost their jobs. Okay, well, well, then we'll just give them money. Where's the money going to come from? Oh, well, we'll just print it. Each time it was just a path of facility. It's the old story. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. Um, and here, you know, you know, locking down people probably was a good intention. It was insanely stupid, but it was a good intention. And sending them checks so they could, you know, keep eating while they were playing video games at home, that was a good intention. And, you know, grabbing all of the Russian assets, that was a good intention. but all of this, you know, we have policymakers that don't take second order effects. And in the end, the road of road to hell is paved with good intentions. And we end up where we are with emerging markets keeping their own currency. It's because people in emerging markets have seen these kinds of cycles before. They've seen the, the seizure of property. They've seen the crazy fiscal policy. They've seen the crazy monetary policy. So when they see it elsewhere, they say, oh, I've seen this movie before. It's the old story. You, you, don't, make your, you don't make your father's mistakes. You make your grandfather's mistakes. And I think in Europe and the United States right now, we're making our grandparents' mistakes instead of our, instead of our parents' mistakes. But in emerging markets, all these mistakes were made not that long ago. Yeah, so they recognize them when they see them. Speaking about you know, the, the, the West, how, what differences would you see um, you know, in behavior of the Western Europeans and the United States in, you know, in the last 12 months also based on, you know, war in Ukraine and all those, you know, geopolitical tensions and the economic world, all those statements by Macron and Scholz, you know, energy, everything, you name it. Uh, so what do you, you know, what do you, what is your take on it? I think Europe is in a tough, tough bind, right? It's, uh, uh, look, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of Macron, but I, I will give him the credit to at least have tried to stop this this horrible war in Ukraine. You know, he you know, before the war, I think he was pretty much the only one 
you know, he was flying to Moscow. He was, he was trying to, to reach some kind of compromise. Um, and he failed, but at least he, you know, he made a valiant effort. Um, it would have been so much better for the world if that valiant effort had been made by the United States. It probably would have been more credible. Because, um, you know, if Putin, I think at this point, if you're Putin and Macron comes in, do you have to take him seriously? What does he really represent, et cetera? But if, you know, if Biden had flown to, to Russia and said, look, let's not do this. Let's find something. Let's, you know, let's find a, a deal we can all agree on. Maybe then maybe. In the U.S. interest, huh, Louis? Maybe it wasn't in the U.S. interest. Yeah, yeah. But uh, no, no. I think it was very much in Europe's interest to try to find a deal. No doubt about that. Um, but uh, I actually think long term it would have been in the U.S. interest because I think the U.S. sees this war as perhaps being in its interest. You know, it sells lots of weapons and it sells lots of energy, um, and so it's and then Europe like you know comes running to the United States and saying, "Look, we need your help. We need your help." Um, but look what's happening. The rest of the world is rapidly turning against the United States. Um, you know, you look at the, the global South, right? The the Indias of this world, the, the the Brazils of this world, even the Mexicos of this world. They're they're, they're not falling in line behind the U.S. on this at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, for me, the most important moment of this year is uh, the Saudi Iran deal that uh, that we've just seen. And you also uh, uh, you highlighted this probable, you know, uh, major change in the history of the world if the House of Saudis betrays the United States. No, no. Look, I think it's, I think it's a huge deal. Um, you know, and seeing the pictures of, you know, uh, Xi Jinping with the leaders, etc. It, you know, you guys are into geopolitics. It sort of recalls. The pictures, and my, my friend Julian Bridgen made, made this point, and I think it's a great point, and I want to give him credit for it. Um, it calls back on the pictures of Carter with Sadat and Begin in the um, in uh, at Camp David, right? Yeah. And back then, the U.S. was, you know, the big poobah. It was the big honcho. It was the U.S. who could bring people together, put them in a room. And say let's let's negotiate this. And you know, Bill Clinton tried to do it as well over Palestine with uh, Rabin, uh, Ray, um, with Yitzhak Rabin and um, and Arafat, and um, and now it's China doing this. You know, all of a sudden it's China putting the Saudis and the Iranians in together, um, partly because China is now the biggest trading partner for both countries. So he can come in and say, look, you know, we're you have I can. Yeah. yeah, I can come in and I'll make sure on both sides that the deal is agreed to, you know. Um, so it's, uh, you know, I, I come in as all I want is peace uh, and because it's in my interest for, for you guys to get along. And I'll make sure that both of you guys get along and that you respect your engagements. Just like the U.S. did between uh, Israel and uh, Egypt. It's a huge change, huge change. Can you imagine, and I, I wonder what the cap, uh, capital markets' reactions uh, would be if uh, China also midwife the, the, the peace uh, between Ukraine and Russia? I mean, no, that would be enormous. I you know, can only be hopeful for that. But this is where you see that Europe has failed, right? Because Europe was Russia's biggest trade partner before all this. Now China is. And it was the biggest trade partner for Ukraine. So Europe should have had this role where it said, look, I'll come in between you two. Um, and you know, let's uh, let's do a deal. Um, uh, and uh, look, this this war in Ukraine is a horrible failure of for Europe. I mean, let's face it; it's uh, I mean, it's obviously a an, a an e- an economic disaster for for the region, but it's it's a human disaster. But it's in terms of foreign policy, um, what a black eye for Europe. It's made, it's been shown to be irrelevant, and I would say if China is in in the end comes in and nego- manages to negotiate some kind of settlement, I mean that's that would be imagine the black eye that would be for the U.S. and the black eye that would be for Europe. It'd be devastating. And this is what I actually I don't think I, it's going to happen. By the way, I don't think it's going to happen. But it's not going to happen. I'm hopeful. I don't think it is. I don't think it is. I, I mean, I want to. I want it to happen because you know, obviously, you, you want the deaths to stop. Um, but I, I'm very skeptical it would happen. This is actually, I remember, one of the most memorable 
it wasn't with conversation with us, I think. I'm not sure, but I don't think it was a conversation with us when you described where the European elites come from and you described how the yeah. French the science pop and uh, yeah. uh, the Germans have the industrial elite that really runs the country. And this one quote allowed me, to, I, I really managed to build a bottle off of this, of Germany's behavior vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine. It was extremely helpful. But now you have a situation where, you know, Macron and uh, von der Leyen are in China or going to China this, this week, I think. We yeah, that's an odd one. Together. That's an odd one. I think that's an odd one. I don't. I don't know how the meetings are going to run, yeah. because you know, it's. Uh, I know how one-on-one -on -one meetings run. Uh, sure. How do? Because they're coming in with with different. Macron's coming in. He wants to do business. You know, yeah. he needs. He needs. He needs a win. You know, after after the year he's had, he yeah. needs. He needs. He needs a win. He needs to sign some contracts. He needs like something, and Van der Leyen is basically coming in. To admonish the Chinese for doing business with Russia. Yeah. I mean, um, I don't know. I don't know if you remember the meeting she had. Uh, she and Charles, Charles Michel had with uh, with Erdogan, and it's yeah. a it's a mean thing to make fun of. But basically, they were sitting at the table and they told. Yeah, yeah, and she was like standing on the side. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she was standing on the side. No, I remember. But I think it's gonna be like I don't understand unless they do separate meetings. I don't understand why Macron would bring her along. To be honest, because it was his trip to begin with. And now he's bringing her along. Um, she's going to bring the mood down, you know. Yeah, she's, I mean, if she if she, if she bangs on about you can't do business with Russia, Xi Jinping is going to say, "I don't want to talk to you." <laughs> I mean, personally, I would guess that uh, I think she, I think he thinks she's harmless because you remember Schultz went to China solo, yep. and then Macron made a big scene out of this, and I guess he took yep. her as an accessory. But then. Yep. But, so I wanted to ask: There is this. There is. There is Macron going to China, and the, you know, the question really is whether how European Union can survive over the long term. And on and at the same time, we have the situation with uh, IRA actually now bearing real results. With uh, you know, the U.S. companies just openly going to Europe and just trying to steal as many investments as they can, like yeah. straight out. What yeah. the European elite does now again. And what does the capital markets make out of all this, Louis? Well, I, I, I'll be fascinated to see what kind of. I, I don't want to. I think it's going to be a disappointed. I think you know Macron's coming in with hopes of big deals, um, and he might get some. You know, he might be able to sell some nuclear power plants. Um, I, apart from nuclear power plants, I can't really see what he's got. What he's got to sell that China will want to buy. Uh, and if he comes back with an empty suitcase, um, then then the the meetings are dud. Especially after the love in that Olaf Scholz just had uh, a, a few months back. Um, so, uh, I, I, how do the capital markets treat this? It might be a non-event. It might be a non-event. Um, it's. Uh, but it, it, it an, or just an event that once again highlights that Europe is becoming more and more irrelevant. You know, it it's trying to exist. It has a card to play, but somehow it just it, it just doesn't end up playing it very well. Can so it, what, what, how what can it retain relevance, Louis, from somebody who understands you know the European elite at the, this period? Well, the obvious, the obvious way to, to maintain relevance, at least vis-a-vis -vis China, is to say, look, um, I know that the U.S. is putting embargo on semiconductors today, and it could be chemical products tomorrow. It could be all these kinds of things, uh, but we'll never do that. You know, we're open for business. We're, you know, we're, we're happy to, uh, to, to, jo to join in with you, um, you know, to sign long-term deals on, on yeah. You know, Nuclear power plants, sign long-term deals on high-speed rail, sign long-term deals on wind power, um, you know, you name it. Um, Keep on and, with globalization as it has been, yeah. And that, yeah, and that's why. But really, the one thing Europe can do, um, and the one thing that we should be exploring aggressively is, the U.S. has decided to go after China on the field of semiconductors. Now, you know, Europe happens to have the one company in, in the Netherlands that is the, the world leader in semiconductor machinery. 
Uh, now, today, it's impossible for the way the machines are produced to be sold in China because they still use U.S. technology. Um, but, you know, ASML should turn around and say, okay, uh, let's make a supply, let's make machines for China that actually don't use U.S. technology. And in this way, gain favor, gain massive favor with China. But of course, if we do that, we the U.S. will be pissed off. So we've actually gone the other way. You know, we're, we're, we're too scared to piss off the U.S. Um, yeah, so that, that might mean that the U.S. Is still have a say in world affairs, yeah. you know. It's a... Oh, no. The U.S. very much has a say. Um, it has, you know, it is, it, it's telling Japanese companies, Korean companies, U.S., uh, Dutch companies, you can do this business, you can't do that business. And, you know, it's, you know, I guess it's a choice. We say, okay, yeah, all right, fine, we'll, uh, we'll comply. You know, we'll, we'll and comply. they are taking terrible losses, like the South Korean chip makers, the couple yeah. months. It's, it's oh, yeah. disaster, right? Um, yeah, it's, it's, well, yeah, China has the biggest semiconductor market yeah. in the world. So it's no, it's not. Uh, it's very, very far from ideal. And do you think that China will come come around its, you know, embargoes? Will they create their own indigenous and mature? Yes, it'll take a while, though. It will take a while. But look, they're pouring money in it. They're pouring engineers in it. Pouring young university graduates. And look, and they're going out to Taiwan and hiring all the engineers they can. And look, you know, the, the best semiconductor company in the world is Taiwanese. So, you know, to, to, to so think Chinese. that it's, yeah, to think that, you know, people always say, oh, yeah, but, you know, China, they can't be creative, um, so they won't be able to make it, etc. It's like, well, the Taiwanese are Chinese. I mean, they're Chinese culture, and they were plenty, cre they were creative enough to be the world's leading semiconductor company, and they're the most efficient semiconductor company in the world. So... You know, how can we sit around and pretend that they're not creative, uh, or sure. that somehow the culture stimmies, st you know, stimmies, um creativity? It's 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 just not true. So no, I think I think they'll get there. The, the the whole question is, you know, how how long to get there? But at some point they will, and when they do, um, then we're yeah, then you know, we'll, then it'll be done. And Louis, can, can, can I, if I may, can I ask you a, a, a more philosophical question? And even, even you know, and even touching on Marx and and stuff, uh, you know, the, the, there is this tension, uh, in my personal opinion, between you know the countries where production is a key factor, you know, so pro production capitalism, however you, yep. you define it, and the financial capitalism, yeah, and the. Uh, you know, they, basically, they are you know cooperating. I mean, those two systems co are cooperating, but the uh, the premiums and awards and the remunerations, you know, and the accents are uh, different. Don't you think that the um, you know the financial capitalism is uh, is overextended to a to a point that the uh, the, the the production forces cannot uh, cannot bear it with it anymore? If you know, if I, I, maybe I'm too too, too general, uh, it's for a book to write, you know, so to speak. And the uh, that this is a sort of a mutiny of the guy that produces that produce things, so to speak. Yep. Yeah, I think these things go 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 in cycles. Um, and you know, I, I don't think your dichotomy is is wrong per se. Um, look, I think one of the big challenges for I would say most Western democracies where we've had interest rates at zero for 15 years or so, is that, you know, when you keep a very low cost of capital, um, the idea when the, the central bankers do that is they want to stimulate growth. They think we'll put cost of capital at zero, everybody will go out, borrow and build a new factory and hire lots of workers and, and it'll be terrific. Um, the reality is that most people take that money and instead of doing capital investments, do financial engineering. Uh, yeah, and you saw you, you saw this you saw this at length in the past 15 years, and we wrote pieces on this. But basically, for every ten dollars borrowed in the U.S., mm -hmm. one was going into capital spending, and nine was going into either buying out your competitor, so you do more M and A, um, or you buy out uh, or you buy back your shares, um, and in so doing, you you boost the price of assets. 
but you haven't created any new capacity. The, the economy is still the same. It's just the asset prices have all gone up, um, but you haven't created anything new. And I think where this has been by far the most prevalent has been the United States, because in the United States, you had a very low cost of capital and very wide availability of capital. So in Europe, we had a low cost, but it wasn't that available. You know, following the uh, European crisis of 2011, 2012, most, um, most, you know, commercial banks were still sort of tightening their book, cleaning up their books. So it wasn't that capital was like super easy to get. Uh, and then in emerging markets, capital was never that cheap. So, yeah, I think a lot of the excesses of this cycle were in the place where, as we're seeing with Silicon Valley going bust, with FTX going bust, et cetera. The excesses in the cycle were done in the place where capital was very cheap and plentiful, and that was mostly the United States. Um, but but it, could, it could be cheap because there is a structural advantage. Well, I think it was cheap based on institutions and the military power and, you know, this, this status quo in the world. Well, because you had this Asian crisis, as we discussed, and all these excesses from emerging markets, all the excess savings were always recycled, mostly in the U.S. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but now, all of a sudden, that's no longer true. And before you know it, capital is no longer that cheap. I understand. I wanted to ask you, Louis, if I, if I could, about China, because you were completely right back when we spoke in October. I was, you know, repeating the, the general idea that she's going to, you know, completely take over which he did, but it's going to involve sort of closing down the markets or being less open. And the opposite happened you know, with Li Chang, right? Uh, yeah. Being, you know, the, the Shanghai boss, the guy who actually wanted, I've heard, to end the COVID uh, yep. you know, restrictions, but got blocked by, by, by this lady from, from Beijing. But And then we had two sessions, uh, beginning of March. And we've had Jack Ma returning to, to the stage, right, with Alibaba. Um, but and, and we have the rebound in Chinese economy, but I guess not as quick as and not as violent as 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 you know as it was presumed. So I wanted to ask you, what's your reading of both what would happen during the two sessions, um, the rebound, and how the Chinese will will position themselves vis-a-vis -vis the markets? The yeah, all all great questions. So look, I think coming into the into the party the party congress. Um, the October Party Congress, you know, in, in the previous year, if you were a policymaker, it was all, you were just, it was all politicking, right? It was, everybody was looking behind their back, making sure nobody was planting a knife in their back. Um, and everybody was trying to position themselves and trying to please Xi Jinping. Um, and, um, and at the same time, not sure whether Xi Jinping would sweep the board or not. Um, now he ends up sweeping the board in November or in October, and then immediately you have demonstrations uh, across China. And I think at this point, the leadership realized, "Hold on, uh, we're at we're at a risk here because our policies are deeply, deeply unpopular, and in essence, we've messed up." Um, and so, with that realization, came action. It's like, okay, COVID's over. <laughs> you know, get on your way. You know, from it was everybody was shocked at how quickly it shifted. Right, um, it went 180 degrees from you can't do anything to just oh you're fine, off you go. And uh, I have to say they reacted with more receptivity to Vox Day, Vox Populi than Macron. For oh yeah. Example. <laughs> oh yeah. You think? <laughs> yes, I think that's an understatement. Um, no, no, they, they, you know, they and. By the way, the you know most people think of the Chinese government as this horrible dictatorship. It is a dictatorship. It is a dictatorship of the party, but it's not. It's also not North Korea. You know, they're not you know s s sitting around drinking cognac uh, and having you know big feasts every day. Um, and they actually do do a lot of surveys of people. And and when people are upset, let's say about property prices, they crack down on property developers. When people are upset about pollution. You know, they, they try to move away from coal. And so, you know, they do respond to Vox Populi, as, as, uh, as, as you point out. So, so they responded. Um, and, and then, you know, having realized, I think, that they, you know, pissed off most people, um, they felt we have to change the topic of conversation. 
And we need to make people happy again because right now people are really unhappy. And the only, the best way to do that is to get growth cranking again. And so I think what you've seen since then, pretty much every measure, whether the removal of the three red lines for property lending, the recapitalization of local authorities, um, the telling the banks to go out and lend, everything has basically been motivated by this, uh, you know, this necessity to get growth to get growth going again. Um, now, having said that, they are—I think—they are managing expectations. They're managing expectations because there's still some um, stumbling blocks or sort of choke points in in the Chinese economy, most notably around everything linked to travel. Um, you know, pre-COVID, and I've, I've mentioned these numbers before, but pre-COVID, China was having roughly 1,300 flights a day, and it was—you know—if you looked at the projections by now, we should be at 1,500 flights a day, but because of the lack of pilots, you're at 300 flights a day. Because what happened when everybody was grounded um, and China was on lockdown, uh, pilots weren't flying. And if you don't fly a certain amount of hours, I don't know what the number is, but if you don't fly a certain number of hours every month and every six months and every year, you lose your license. So now they have to retrain all their pilots. And so, you know, that, 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 takes, that, that takes some time. You also have the fact that nobody has passports. You know, most people's passports expired during COVID. So you have all these sort of choke points that I think are are meaning that the 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 rebound is still, you know, not not super super strong. Um, but I think as we come into the second and the third quarter, a lot of these start to fade away, and then and then the the Chinese rebound will surprise most people on the upside. And you know, when I look at the bank lending numbers. Um, and again, we have new bank lending numbers today. Again, very strong, very strong. So, all all that points to to more activity in in the pipeline. And in terms of international, uh, the, the way they approached Xi, and you know, I, I read the, the all the statements by him by Qing Gang or Qing Gang. I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, but the new foreign minister. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When it came to foreign investment and further opening up, which is, I guess, the key. To make sure that the U.S. cannot really create what it wanted, which is you know containment of China, and that's exactly you know, right. Yeah. That's exactly right. Look, if China wants to de-dollarize, it's one thing. If it wants to do more of its trade in renminbi, it's another thing. But if it really wants to do trade in renminbi, which I think is what it really wants, it has no choice but to open up its capital markets more to foreigners. I mean, it's just. Um, you know, if you want to tell India and Indonesia and Philippines, hey, let's trade more in renminbi, the guy on the other side is going to say, well, what am I supposed to do with these renminbi? You know, I'm not going to frame them and put them on my wall in the office. Um, I have, I need to be able to do something. And and the whole, you know, you could say to, you can say, well, you can buy stuff in, made in China, but most of these countries already do that. Um, so beyond stuff, you need to give them the opportunity to buy assets, whether that be fixed income. Whether that be domestic real estate, um, and so it is, it is, it is happening. Okay, last question, Albert, because you know. Okay, I actually got to approaching one hour. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm always long-winded. You guys should know this. No, they were fantastic. I mean, the, <laughs> you know, as long as you don't tell us to to, to just leave, I mean, I'm gonna <laughs> no, no. them. I had one is very general and kind of weird. I know it's gonna be difficult to answer, but the. The question it it is assumed that you have to have a reserve currency, but today you know whether I don't think it's this necessary, right? I I couldn't agree more. This is see I think this is um, this is a very important point you're making, and I'm sorry to jump in and interrupt you, but I think it's so important because most people you know obviously look at the U.S. dollar, and because we've lived in the U.S. you know all of us have known nothing but a U.S. dollar world, and before that they say oh before that we had the sterling world and. You know, before that, Gilder, the Florent yeah. Duca, et cetera, and the, the guild. Most people imagine that you need to have a reserve currency and you need to have like one trade currency. And then you say, okay, well, because we need to have one currency, really nobody can compete with the dollar, right? Because, you know, China falls way short and the euro falls way short. And, you know, the uh, the the renminbi, the yen, and you know, nobody quite, quite makes it. Um, and that's true if your starting point, if your starting premise is we need to have one reserve currency for everybody. But to your point, you know, 
why do China and India need to trade in U.S. dollar? Why do they need to settle their trade in U.S. dollar? Why can't they settle their trade in renminbi or um, or rupees? Um, it's really a, a technological problem, right? Where we built all these pipes, and all the pipes were based off the U.S. dollar. Um, but technological solutions today are just ones and zeros in a computer. It really isn't that the challenge it it used to be to you know to to build new trade settlement computer programs is it's a, it's an afternoon's worth of work. I'm exaggerating, of course, but um, so yeah, I think people can have trouble conceptualizing a world where all of a sudden we have tons of different currencies and tons of different cross currency settlements. Um, because we've lived in such a unipolar currency world, it's they assume that you have to go from one unipolar currency to another unipolar currency. The most, the more likely development is you go from one unipolar currency to a multitude of currencies, which makes for a much more unstable world and and you know a more challenging world to analyze. Yeah. And the last one, if I could, because I remember at the very beginning of our conversation, you pointed out that. One of the elements of you know this tectonic shift in the world is that uh, demographics are changing, and, and you know it's it's yeah, it's decreasing. But there is a continent where it clearly isn't. And when I, I I'm saying I'm, I'm saying that because I remember listening to both really to Xi but also to Putin, and I saw their messaging being more and more like. You could see that apart from trying to uh, be a meanie to, to Europeans and saying to them that they, they aren't relevant, you could see that they really directed their message at the global south, at the African, yes. you know? Yeah. And do you see a way, when, when you think about Chinese model and whatever they want to achieve and, you know, how they want to remodel to an extent the international order, do you see a way for them, for example, powered by 5G or connectivity, you know, where 5G is an element of it? To really embed the, the African population into like a productive, you know, employment. Do you see this happening? Never say never, but look, I think the the history of most empires is you build the roads to bring in commodities cheaper and push out higher value added goods um, and keep the high value added. Right. This is what Britain did. Would take all the Indian cotton, all the Egyptian cotton, bring it to the UK transform the cotton into clothes and then sell the clothes back to the Egyptians or the Indians and keep all the margins in the UK. Um, you know, this is why in Europe we say all roads lead to Rome. You know, that's what empires do, build roads, push out, bring in commodities, push out finished goods. So I think the, and I, I think when you listen to Xi Jinping, when you listen to the one belt, one road, deep down, that's, that's the model. You know, it's bring in, build the ports, build the railways, build the, uh, uh, the infrastructure so that we can get all the commodities back to us. Um, we transform them here because we're the number one industrial power. So we transform them and then, you know, we can sell them back um, their high value added finished goods. And ideally we do all this in a non us dollar currency, um, you know, so that we capture all the value added all up and down the chain, the financial chain, the, uh, the, sure. and, uh, you know, if China starts to run out of workers, then maybe they'll say, okay, let, let's start building, you know, um, plants in, in Africa, but, but we're not there. For now, you know, China is building plants. It's building plants in, in Vietnam. It's building plants in Indonesia. It's building plants in places where culturally it's much easier for them to do so, partly because you have uh Chinese communities already that have been embedded for 200 years. You know, you go to Vietnam, you go to Indonesia, you go to Thailand, you go to Malaysia. The business communities there are primarily Chinese. Um, mm -hmm. They speak Chinese. They, uh, you know, they're, they're really from the same culture, even 200 years later, right? Because partly because they intermarried between themselves. And yeah. uh, so, so that's, you know, if they look for workers, that's the more obvious reservoir because culturally for them, it's so easy. Yeah. Yeah. I was asking this because I remember Kishore Mabubani. I don't know if you, the Singaporean politician. Uh, oh, the the former fine, uh, the former foreign minister. Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember because it was it was also interesting because you know he presented an Asian perspective and he wasn't really into the sensitivities there are in Europe and around Europe. No. 
Yeah. And he said, this is uh, one way to, uh, let's, let's put it this way, prevent major migration flows from Africa into Europe, if you could find a meaningful yeah, employment. You, and, and yeah, I, you, huh? You're going to get the migration flows. Yeah, yeah it's true. <laughs> okay, let's, let's put an end at this point, uh, which is disappointing for everybody, Luis, but, you know, <laughs> we need to respect uh, your time and, you know, one hour during hectic no. times, uh, you know, as we have today. Thank you very much. Our go our guest today was Louis Vincent Gaff. Uh, uh, Albert Świdziński, Jacek Bartosiak. You stay with us at Strategy and Future. Thank you, Louis. Great to see you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Have a good one.